So thank you for joining us, Dr. Gigi, in terms of this, having this project with us. Footprints Project is about walking your journey with us. And as you walk your journey, you share with us some of the teachable moments, some of the great insights and enablers in your personal development with an aim of inspiring and actually mentoring the next generation of young professionals in the space. So maybe as we get started, you could just share with us what were your career journey, how where you practice, how you practice those spaces, and what are the transitions that you had across the journey? Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. I'm a pharmacist. Currently, I teach at Kabarak University as a senior lecturer. Prior to that, I did work in the pharmaceutical industry where I worked in three companies. I worked at House and McGeorge. I worked at um, um, Cosmos Limited. And lastly, I did work at Ellis Chemical Industries Limited. In these three companies, I did work. The first one, I worked as a QC manager. The second one, I did work as a QC manager. And at Ellis Chemical Industries, I did work as the QA manager and at the same time as the company pharmacist. Prior to working in the pharmaceutical industry, I had worked at a drug analysis research unit. This was a government unit, but it was situated at the Department of Pharmacy, University of Nairobi. At this unit, I did work as a pharmaceutical analyst. In regard to schooling, I did my um, basic degree at Nairobi University, where I got a BFARM. And then after that, I did my master's degree in pharmaceutics in the US, in Iowa. And um, I did my PhD. So my PhD, I did work with the industry for um, two years. Then I joined academia. Thank you for that. So when you graduated from the University of Nairobi with a BFARM degree, definitely from the Kenyan education system, you'll move into practicing at the government facilities in the public health system. So where, how did that transition from schooling into practice work for you? And then after being posted, let's probably in a clinical setting, how did that transition happen? That's an interesting question. Ideally, um, I would just share with you um, my career path from the time I graduated. Hmm. After I graduated, I did my internship at um, um, Dow Pharmaceuticals here in Nairobi. Hmm. That was my industrial rotation. I did my community and hospital rotation in Kisumu. After my internship, I was then posted to Osengishu District Hospital in Eldoret. Um, it was at this hospital that I did realize that actually I was not wired to work in a hospital setting. Basically, um, I realized that I am a person that is structured, just understanding myself. And while I was in school, I really liked chemistry. Mm -hmm. And being in hospital during those days, there wasn't really much that one could be able to do. Mm -hmm. What we did was basically dispensing. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, it was kind of an anticlimax mm -hmm. after having been through a very rigorous pharmacy school. So at this point, I decided to reach out to uh, my previous supervisor at school. I had done my project and uh, Dr. Ogeto, and uh, he mentored me quite a bit, even while I was still on campus. Mm -hmm. So I wrote to him and it's like, I am at, at this hospital and I really don't enjoy what I'm doing? Is there anything, any other opportunity that I could be able to try as a pharmacist? Mm. So he said that, why don't you try Daru? Mm -hmm. And 
unfortunately, I did ask for a transfer to Daru and I got it right away. So after a year of being in hospital, I transitioned to Daru. And at Daru, um, what used to happen there was basically um, technical evaluation of the products that were being bought in Kenya and being um, the products that are being bought or those products that are for tendering. So these products were to, used to be brought to Daru. We analyze them and if they comply, then they are um, they pass so that they can be able to to be bought by uh, by Kemsa. So basically, we were part of the technical evaluation group that was there to ensure that the products that were being sold to Kenyans met the uh, quality specifications. Okay, thank you for that. So when you're now in Daru, you're working in Daru doing the technical analysis and all that. So what are some of the key skills that you needed at that particular level to do these analysis beyond the research skills and your actual inclination towards pharmaceutical science? And how was the experience at Daru for you? I think for me, Daru was um, a blessing for me because this is where it all began. Because mm -hmm. I got to Daru, I had done my project in pharmaceutical chemistry and uh, uh, Dr. Ogeto. I remember my project was on um, stability of penicillins. Mm -hmm. So with that interest, uh, just coming to Daru and um, starting to work on analysis of pharmaceutical products was very interesting for me. So um, I was very keen. I was very interested. I think that is basically um, how I, I I'm, I'm wired. I just I just liked chemistry. So I was very fortunate because at Daru there was opportunity for me to be able to excel in this. I was fortunate to work with Professor Kibwagi, who was actually my immediate supervisor. And um, together with uh, Professor Kibwagi, there were technicians who were really good in their work. I remember one, uh, Jotu Ranira, he was very good. So I did work hand in hand with Ranira just to help me get to understand the basic techniques of working in the lab, good laboratory procedures, preparation of reagents, and all this. Mm -hmm. So he helped me in that so that I could be able to, to, to know the techniques that we use for analysis, even basic lab report writing, those things that you need to know in the lab. So the technicians were very instrumental and uh, I did work closely with Professor Kibwagi who um, had equipment that he used for university students. And one of the things that I did while at this unit was just to, uh, to ask Professor Kibwagi if I could be able to work with him so that I could be able to get to know how to use the equipment that he has. And um, he was very gracious and it's like, why not? And uh, he had research work that he was doing. It's like, join in, we can be able to do this. And then he could give me some work mm -hmm. and with Turanira, mm -hmm. and he instructs Turanira on how I should be able to know how to take accurate volumes, how to take readings, and we went into all those details together with Jotha Ranira, so that in a short while, I was confident enough to do some of these techniques on my own. So I think that uh, just being um, inquisitive and proactive was very, very beneficial in my, in ensuring that that transition was not a challenge at all. I was interested, I was keen, I wanted to learn. And because of that, I think everything else was manageable. Yeah, and that is very critical in the sense that you have the interest, you are inquisitive, and actually when you got the job, you are learning from people, the technicians, Professor Kibwage who served as your mentor, but also at the same time the supervisor of the department. 
and I realized that actually in the process of that, then that is where you got your opportunity to pursue your master's. So how did that come to be? Uh, that's a very interesting question. And you see, while at this unit, um, I had uh, worked with Prof Professor Kibwagi for quite a bit. We had uh, written three papers together. This was after three years. Mm -hmm. And then there was this advert by USAID. They want, there were scholarships uh, for the US um, to, um, these uh, scholarships were for um, young leaders in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So um, basically what was required um, was that you were either from the government or private sector and um, you uh, you had um, some leadership um, skills and the um, the main reason for this training was to develop that and the leadership skills plus technical skills so that when you come back you can be able to improve on human capacity in Kenya. And one of the requirements for this program was that you go you are trained, but you had to come back so that you can be able to improve human capacity in the various areas that you're working at. So I applied for it. And one of the uh, things that was actually required was um, a recommendation from your unit. And uh, Professor Kibwagi did give me an excellent recommendation. And I believe that that contributed to me getting that scholarship. Yeah. So thank you for that. And one of the key things that I would just ask on the backdrop of that is the sense that the opportunity came when you were at the university, you got a mentor who wrote a, a good recommendation for you in terms of the work that you're doing. But then what happened, let's say, for example, as David wanted to pursue a master's and probably I'm exploring options out of the country, what are the key things that could be enablers in terms of making that decision to take that scholarship or that opportunity as a learning opportunity? And then when the decision on whether to come back, in your case, it was clear in actually in terms of the recommendation was to make a commitment to come back and contribute to leadership and management in the local context. So what would be your advice around that for young professionals? I think for young professionals, um, if you're thinking of uh, pursuing further studies, the first thing that you need to do is to really interrogate yourself. What is it that you want and why do you want it? So if what you want is locally available. Why don't you do it locally? Because it's cheaper here, and some of the universities here offer very good programs. Mm -hmm. So if what you want to do is local, go ahead and do it. But if you have a scholarship, or if you have the means to do it, then go ahead and do it wherever. The UK and US have very good programs. Mm -hmm. But then as you do this, I believe that you should also have interrogated yourself to find out what is it that you really want to do. And when you have done it, where do you want to land? Do you want to come back? Do you want to stay in the US? Do you want to stay in UK? Make all these decisions. I know of a, a girl that I mentored while I was at Illis Chemical Industries. Mm -hmm. She's in UK, she has done her PhD, she has stayed on. So what is it that you want? If you want to stay out there, then there are many programs that you can be able to do, that you can be able to excel out there. So these opportunities are there, but you really must interrogate yourself to find out what you want to become and where you want to practice at. If you're coming back to Kenya, then most probably do something that is relevant. But if you are brave enough, you could do something that is different, but then you can be the starter. So mm -hmm. all this is possible. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you but for that. Also, you, just, you just have also to know that uh, uh, studying out there is hard work. So you have to go prepared to work really hard. Yeah. And it's the commitment that you know why you're doing it, you're getting aligned on how you go about it. And then at the end of the day, you ask yourself, what do you want to apply that knowledge in? And I think that is very critical. And that takes me to my next question in the sense that 
after your master's, you came back into the country. Then after that, that is when you transition into the pharmaceutical industry space. So how was that move from Daru after finishing your master's, getting into the local pharmaceutical manufacturing industries? How did you make the leap? Because one of the other bits that I realized in one of our conversations recently with a young colleague is like, I did my master's outside the country, but getting to plug into the local ecosystem becomes a challenge. I have a master's, yes, I have the qualifications, but how do I get the jobs? And I think that maybe you could share more on that. Okay. Um, I, I'll talk about myself first. Yes. Um, I, I came back and six months after coming back, actually there was a, an opportunity in one of the companies. But even with that, um, my privilege was that while at Daru, basically, I was an analyst and I was a good analyst. So I had been equipped um, practically, theoretically, and also uh, had man management skills. Actually, one of the things that I didn't mention was that this program that we did, uh, it, it was a package that had both technical and management training. So we did like uh, many courses on management, you know, just preparing you to come back and transition to wherever. So mm -hmm. basically when I came back, I was ready to move on. And the good thing also uh, that I had was, Professor Kibwek was still there. I came and it's like, okay, it's this opportunity, take it. Mm -hmm. But however, when you go to the industry, many times you have to be careful because then if you're interested in your academia, sometimes that does not aga well with some companies. Mm -hmm. So you have so you have to make sure that when you get there, you tell them that this is what I want for my life. Mm -hmm. So when I went, I did uh, mention that, yes, I'm joining you, but I want to pursue this. So it was agreeable and mm -hmm. Professor Kibwagi fixed me in from Kim as an honorary lecturer. And that is how my journey with lecturing started. So basically for me, the transition was easy because I, I was fit for the intended use in the industry, as we would say in pharmaceutics. <laughs> if, <laughs> if you have just qualified and um, you want to join the industry. Mm -hmm. One thing that I would propose is this. The industries is look, are looking for you. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would say. However, the joining point is what may be not very uh, exciting. Because sometimes when you come in at that level, um, the industry will ask you, can we take you at, because we know that at this level, we have to train you a little bit so that you can be able to um, understand the practical aspects of working here. Mm -hmm. Can you start at this point, then after a year or two, when you're ready to work as a manager, then your scale can go to B, C, and D. Mm. My advice would be that uh, even for young pharmacists who don't have masters, there are opportunities out there. When you go there and there's opportunity and they offer, they give you an offer, usually most of the industries I know that they would give you an offer, which is a little less than what the government is offering. But it's like, you negotiate so that you're saying that, yes, the first two years, this will be it. But then after that, you know, your salary can be able to improve. So basically what I'm saying is that because of the challenge that there is in that gap, mm -hmm. I believe that the pharmacists who are joining the industry should have that in mind, should have that in mind, because the first one or two years, they will not actually be working as pharmacists. They will, they will kind of, they'll be under training. And so because of that, 
um, they should be able to embrace that. Mm -hmm. And by the way, after those two years, you'll be very marketable as well. <laughs> oh, for so sure. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and I think that's very critical in the sense that most of the times we look at what is the immediate offer but not looking at what the other non-explicit benefits of these opportunities because you might be coming in you don't have as yes. much of the skills but when you plug into that company you have you're gaining skills and you're also getting making a living out of it two three years down the line you're more marketable you're more qualified and therefore you can negotiate from another level so that is amazing exactly. yeah 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 Yes, so yes. based on that experience, the other key thing that I would just ask is, uh, you had interest in academia, and I think you already started, mentioned in the sense that you are working in the industry, you're taking an offer from the industry perspective, but also making it clear that I have an interest in the academic space, and therefore I'll be taking an honorary lecturing opportunity at the University of Nairobi that is at that particular moment. So how did you blend the two, and how was your move towards academia, and what is the interest behind it? Okay. Um... Basically, and teach for uh, yeah. for two hours. It, it did give me, you know, just a break uh, from the um, manufacturing environment. I also actually uh, realized that at the bottom of my heart, I'm a researcher. And I knew that at one point in my life, I will end up at the university. I knew that. Mm. I knew that. So I needed to keep that link. Mm. And that's why towards uh, my later years in the um, industry, I actually decided just to go back and do my PhD because I knew that to get to the university, you needed that. Mm. So I had the passport that I needed to get to, to the university. Yes. Okay, that's good. So now I'm uh, working as a lecturer. What are some of the key gaps that you're seeing in academia that can be bridged from the industry? And how do we go about bridging those gaps in terms of training for professionals and especially pharmacists in this case? Um, actually, one of the reasons that I, I moved to the university when I did was just to help build local capacity for the industry. Mm -hmm. And this was because looking at the industry, you, you you know, I looked at it and it's just like sometimes it's very, very difficult to get local capacity to fill certain positions. Mm. So I I thought that maybe going back to university would contribute a little bit in just developing uh, people that students, pharmacists that know a little bit about what manufacturing is all about. Mm. Because you realize that um, on campus, like during our days, and even now, most of the students know very little regarding pharmaceutical manufacturing. And this is where it all begins, because most students are very conversant with clinical pharmacy, they're very conversant with community um, hospital. But then when it comes to industrial pharmacy, they know the name, but what happens there, very few of them no. So um, the first gap that I see is that most students are not familiar with what is out there. So um, we need to talk a little bit more so that the students get exposed, so that students can be able to understand that there is another option apart from community that I could take. There's another option that I should try to learn. What is it? Am I wired towards that? So um, that is a gap. And one way that we could be able to improve for in that is just uh, uh, being deliberate in regard to the interactions between students and people working in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, the universities should invite people from the industry so that they can be able to come and speak to the students so that the students can be able to know if you are a QC manager, a QA manager, what do you do? 
your day to day, how is it like? So that they have this picture of what it is um, to work in the industry. The other thing uh, that I would say is that, and this is a big one, mm. um, pharmaceutical, when you're doing um, industrial pharmacy, mm. it's very different from clinical pharmacy because clinical pharmacy, um, you can be able to use your memory 100%. Mm. But when it comes to um, the industry, most of what is done there is application. So you have to learn how to transition from that theory to applying that theory to a situation. And that is where the big gap is. So one way of starting um, to mitigate that, I believe, is to focus a little bit more as we do our teaching on the practical aspects in pharmaceutics and in analytical chemistry. So that when the students are doing these practicals, they start learning for real um, the GLPs that are required. How do you use a balance? Um, one of the things that I always say is that yes, you'll be going to that company to work as a manager, but as a manager, you must know, you're not doing the wing yourself, but you must know how the balance works. You will not be doing the analysis itself, but you must know how to troubleshoot. So you have to know all these techniques. So we should try as much as possible to start training the young um, pharmacists or students in these areas so that it's easier for them to catch it when they get um, to the university, um, to the industry. The other thing that we ought to do is to encourage partnerships between universities and um, the industry. You find that some of the industries have very qualified people that would actually teach at the university. There's some areas that you need a person that has worked with those equipment to be able to teach in a way that the students can be able to understand better. So you find that in areas, especially engineering areas, such as the HVAC system, water purification system, even unit operations, mm -hmm. it's much easier for a practitioner to teach those units than a person who has just learned about these units theoretically. So that interaction would be very, very good. And in fact, as the students interact with these practitioners from the industry, this will be a way of really uh, opening their eyes so that they can be able to see what else is out there so that the opportunities out there can be used by the many pharmacists now who are out there. And I believe that some of them do not have jobs. So that partnership is also key in ensuring that uh, um, this gap that we have is actually getting smaller and smaller. That is pretty cool. Having that industrial collaboration with academia so that people know what opportunities, what opportunities are out there, but also they learn from the people who are doing the work so that they can put it into context. And I think that is a very critical bit that we need to see how to drive and how to ensure that it continues moving forward. So thank you for that perspective. But at the same time, let's say look at, at it. And, yes. And in fact, to add to that, like I know that some of these companies have equipment that they could actually be able to give to these universities. Sometimes mm -hmm. they just put them in warehouses and they're not useful at all. So when there's that kind of collaboration, then the industry can be able to help the university and the university can be able to come up with, you know, uh, formulations that the industry can be able to use so that we have all this understanding between the university and the industry so that we are building the industry together so that each of them sees their um, usefulness because in any memorandum of understanding everybody wants to know you know what is there for me yeah, yeah so both sides have to benefit yeah Thank you for that. I think that is a very critical bit. So the other question that I'll ask in terms of that, you working in the academic space and all that, 
how do you look at the value of mentorship from your personal career and mentorship to students as young people who are coming into the industry? Um, I would say that uh, mentorship is um, is key um, for anyone who really wants uh, to have a good progression in their career. Um, I did recognize that early enough in uh, my career, and I would say that uh, um, that has been very, very instrumental. I did mention uh, Dr. Ghetto, who helped me, and Professor Kibwage. I have had other mentors, such as um, Dr. Gaja, Dr. Wanyanga, all these have had an input in my life. One thing that I want to mention here is that even as I have related with these mentors, for me, it has not been uh, a way of getting a job and then letting them go. Uh -uh. It has been a process of developing me so that I can be able to achieve the purpose and the goal that I have for life. Mm -hmm. So I needed this mentors to help me in decision making, in aligning myself to that career. I need those kind of people 